Good afternoon. I'm Rob Murphy, Head of Investment Companies at Edison Group. And uh, today um, it's our third in a series of real assets in an uncertain world. Today we're going to be focusing on infrastructure. We've had two renewables events. Um, those can be found on the website along with the accompanying videos. Um, and today we've got three, um, three funds. Uh, we'll be addressing all the key issues everyone's concerned about. So I'll, I'll briefly just introduce uh, everybody on the call. Um, first up, we have Frank Schramm, who is co-CEO of BBGI, and uh, he's representing BBGI Global Infrastructure Fund. Uh, secondly, we have Nalaka De Silva, who is Head of Private Market Solutions at Aberdeen Asset Management, and uh, he's representing Aberdeen Diversified Income and Growth Fund. And uh, finally, uh, over in the States, we've got uh, Chris Abbott, partner and co-head of Riverstone Credit, and he's representing Riverstone Credit Opportunities Income Fund, uh, which is actually the only credit fund we've got in the series, but uh, it invests exclusively in Infra energy infrastructure. Um, so a uh, slightly different take on things from Chris. Welcome everybody. Absolutely. So let's kick off. Let's kick off. Lots to lots to talk about. With uh, we're just just saying, you know, oil's hitting uh, 124 Brent today. Um, but if if we if we shift to the the sort of the longer term drivers first of infrastructure, um, you know, what what is driving demand? For infrastructure, and we'll, we'll sort of look at the governmental side and then the investor side um, first of all. So maybe Frank, uh, you know, BBJ is a very large uh, global infrastructure fund. Um, uh, you know, one point two three billion market cap, uh, and you work very closely with governments in in your projects. Um, so maybe. Can you talk a bit about what's driving the demand? It has, is anything changing um, that you see given recent events, or is it not really that related? Uh, is it just more driven by kind of policy? Yeah, thanks for the question, actually, uh, Rob. Um, I think maybe leaving aside the green for a second here, but, but the, the big overriding scheme here um, is currently uh, climate change here. And there are, that this will be the big driver actually for the next years here. Yeah. A big spend money spending is already on the way, and, there, um, and there, there's much more to come. Yeah. And there, if you look at the recent uh, um, McKinsey study, this is just about $130 trillion to flow into large capital projects in the next, in the next five years. Yeah. And there, um, they have actually investigated about 50 countries which are now stimulus packages, and, there, um, and they, the vast, vast majority will go into the support of climate transition infrastructure um, and to meet the Paris Agreement. Yeah? And they're also to, to, to support the climate, climate transition, transition generally. Um, given the large amounts, this huge amounts here um, involved, you know, the need of the private sector is mandatory. The uh, public sector can't spend all that money. You know, uh, the, the GDP levels are already at, uh, at, at, at their historic high levels. Yeah, so um, this this will drive certainly the, the the big the big from my point of view the biggest driver of the demand. Um, from BBGI point of view, actually, uh, when we look at the infrastructure, um, the key point for us is we need long term steady cash flow, which is a typical feature of infrastructure generally. Yeah, we've got a portfolio with an average life of about twenty years. We invest in social infrastructure here, you know, and um, and so we've got governments as clients, and um, they are typically rated triple AA, A, double A, and we receive contracted cash flows from that government clients. The second point, which is a very topical at, uh, point, is also in inflation linkage. You know, this is this is one of the probably probably the key feature together with the long term stable cash flow. Given the high inflationary environment or we're currently in here, you know, and even Europe and Germany you now now actually have got inflation rates um, up to eight percent. UK RPI is, is is projected to be ten um, percent uh, plus. You know, no one could have, would have ever thought about that even six months ago. You know? and, um, and our cash flows are inflation linked. You know? That's a key feature. And that's also what we're looking for if you invest in new infrastructure. Um, and 
The third one is uh, obviously uh, it's strong ESG or credentials. I mentioned uh, the uh, the climate action uh, plan and uh, net zero by 2050. Yeah, ESG is the the mega topic here, yeah, irrespective of the Ukraine crisis, and uh, so therefore we look for that. And obviously, um, infrastructure in the end uh, is is the key the key one for investors is that's largely uncorrelated with the wider equity market. Yeah, and I suppose just in terms of the sort of government demand, as you say, most governments in developed markets are uh, not not flush with cash, let's say, um, especially coming out of a pandemic and all the other stuff that's going on. Um, and I think also just looking at your assets, you're not that sensitive to GDP. Um, so maybe you can explain, you know, the, the sort of the availability, um, you know, versus kind of demand side of things for your assets? Yeah, no, no, great question. Um, and and th thanks for pointing that out. Um, so when we enter into, I mean, if you buy a project, you're, we, we buy into availability-based uh, projects. What does it mean? Um, we are paid to make the asset available. Yeah, so um, for example, a road, once it's built, we have to make sure that the road is actually in good condition, uh, that the grass is actually uh, mowed in the, in the summer, the, the snow is cleared in the winter, and the asphalt is in good condition, yeah, and actually make sure that, uh, um, that, that actually you do with your uh, rehabilitation, uh, heavy maintenance cycles whenever that's needed. Yeah, but we're not paid for how many cars are on the road. So it's independent of the demand. Yeah? So we get a fixed contractual, contractual payment from the government sector, yeah, government party, yeah, and that's also inflation linked. Great, thanks, Frank. Frank, uh, so, so uh, yeah, Nalaka, as an, a kind of investor in the space, and you've got your underlying investors, and then obviously in Aberdeen, you've got a, a large um, private markets and alternative uh, markets uh, business. What what is driving investors, um, you know, to, to, in, into these uh, kind of in, in investments? What what are the attractions you see? I think uh, Frank covered, you know, kind of the major ones. I think we, um, as a portfolio constructor, are looking for, um, you know, diversified sources of return. We're looking at, um, you know, income stability, you know, the variability, you know, th that can see through economic cycles. So infrastructure definitely plays its role in that. Inflation, um, as we talked about, makes a big part of it. So, you know, from, from the in infrastructure teams that are, uh, you know, we, we run two major programs, both on the concession side, um, you know, social infrastructure, um, you know, long-term concessions against schools, hospitals, developed with those types of assets, along with economic infrastructure, transport utilities, and energy assets, they bring different characteristics to the portfolio. So, so we're seeing um, long-term stable cash flows being the major driver for that. Inflation linkage rates uh, and discount rate management, I think, is, is important as we go through what is going to be a, a fairly turbulent time. And um, you know, from the context of, of ADIG, or the diversified uh, income and growth fund once we're trying to uh, meet a dual mandate of providing income and stable income that's uh, got some that's called a sustainable characteristic so they are, are they going to be uh, reliable dependable in the long term infrastructure definitely plays a role in that and i think um so as a portfolio investor <clears throat> you know we see that as value and i think from the underlying investment team standpoint uh you know that is their core business uh, de-risking projects in in developed and uh, emerging markets uh, and providing those available streams of cash flows, whether it be, uh, you know, developing assets or buying standing stock uh, from from greenfield to to brownfield. So, uh, so you know, I think from an investor standpoint, it's a definitely a core part of portfolio construction today. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, and I suppose you know, given the, I guess the macro uncertainty, has has anything changed in your view? I mean. Uh, I, I guess, as Frank said, you know, has inflation surprised you on the upside, and does that lead you to change what you you know what you're doing in the portfolio? No, I think we've we've always had a core view around uh, what inflation, what what the role of infrastructure does in the context of inflation and rates movements. So I think um, whether we think about discount rates under the lying or the or the debt that we're we're investing in, uh, we tend to uh, we shortened our duration um, in terms of the portfolio to to allow for floating rates to be able to capture some of the raise, rising rates in infrastructure. Um, and uh, I think from a, sorry, I think everyone was sort of caught short in terms of the surge um, around sort of the rise of inflation. And the question is how, how sustained is that going to be? Is that going to be transitory uh, to a certain extent or will it tail back? Um, but the role of infrastructure in the portfolio is to see beyond a short-term economic 
cycle. You know, we're investing for 20, 30 years on these assets, as, uh, as we talked about earlier. So uh, it's got to ride through that. I think it's 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 definitely more reliable uh, in the context of those uh, visible cash flows, which are you know either contractually based or, or where demand is is more reliable. Um, uh, but you know, when we start looking at energy assets, for example, that's when you know the supply side does have considerations. I think um, you know we just get before the call, but um, you know the the geopolitical um, environment has changed significantly. You know, in terms of energy, uh, particularly around Europe, uh, we're investing also in developed and emerging markets. So, uh, looking at the impact of currency um, in emerging markets and what that means, uh, you know, for the dollar and what that means for uh, emerging markets investing in infrastructure and sourcing capital to deploy for societal good. You know, building schools and hospitals and stadiums around the world, you know, um, requires financing. So, so all of these factors, I think. Um, allow us to to have to have a view to portfolio construction, but actually, in the near term, risk management around that is really key. You know, working with very you know sort of strict parameters around where we deploy capital is important to to maintain the discipline around some of the you know the areas that we do invest in at the moment. Yeah, that's uh, keep. We'll come on to risk, I think, a bit bit later because that's uh, another interesting topic. I think. Um, so yeah, Chris. Um, you know, I guess you're 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 at the heart of you know energy financing. Um, you know what what's driving the demand um you know for your your uh, financing um and i guess i'm thinking a little bit obviously we've got you know the current sort of oil situation but i guess a lot of the projects you're financing are, are, are fairly long term in nature to bring things on stream um so maybe, maybe you can talk a bit about you know how, how sensitive yeah. is the kind of short term econ economics well i i think we're um we're a bit different than the other two panelists for a couple of reasons. One is that we're debt and not equity. Um, so we're taking a little rest, less risk just being in the senior part of the capital structure. Um, but we're also more concentrated. We're only focused on the energy space uh, and energy infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> but we do, we do actually do, Robert, try to combat that with a shorter duration project. So while some of the things that we're investing in or helping to develop are longer term assets, we're, we're really hitting them at the development stage where it will take hopefully somewhere between one and two years to get an asset up and running and online. Um, and we're trying to bridge that period where there won't be much credit support um, to where there will be a lot of credit support. Um, and this is, this is going to be on the non-investment grade end of the spectrum for, for energy infrastructure assets. Um, in terms of what's driving demand, I'd say it's really interesting because you have a you know, you've got a push and a pull um, on the on the on the push side. You know, obviously the desire to have a net zero energy economy um, is is paramount, and it's sort of dominating a lot of policy out there. Um, you see, you know, country after country set goals, company after company set goals, and that that is really driving a lot of what uh, what is happening. Um, the meanwhile, uh, the demand side is also increasing. So I think our estimates are that energy consumption globally is going to go up about 50% over the next 20 to 30 years. So how do you, how do you grow uh, energy supply and distribution um, by 50% while decarbonizing to zero uh, at the same time? And really those, those two themes are what we see driving the need for our capital. Um, you know, en energy transition as we see it is really you know, it's defined, it's the, it's the transformation from a hydrocarbon-based energy uh, business to a, a zero-carbon energy business. Um, so all of our deals are meant to facilitate that transition one way or the other, but definitely definitely on the shorter duration end of spectrum um, and driven by those factors that I mentioned. And I, I suppose the, yeah, that transition is interesting because I think all, all the loans you do now uh, have a, a, a green or sustainable and um, I, I guess that there's, there's an investor demand for those kind of loans these days as well, right? So as well as the companies looking to transition. I, I mean, I think, want, if, want to, uh, I think the way we look at it is um, if, you're, if you're trying to go from a hydrocarbon based energy economy to a zero carbon based energy economy, there's two ways to do it. Um, one, you can build new green infrastructure um, to replace the old economy. Um, or two, you can provide capital to the old economy to decarbonize it along the way. Um, and I think uh, our belief is that you have to do both simultaneously because if you overemphasize 
one or the other, uh, you're left in a, in a tough spot. In fact, you know, I firmly believe that Brent's at 125 today for that very reason. <laughs> People have underestimated, underinvested dramatically in the old economy uh, in favor of the new economy. And not to say that's bad, uh, but it has consequences, right? It has consequences when you have a, a supply shock like what you're having. With um, so uh, our belief is the, the best way to, to forward to net zero that has the the best impact um, on climate and also the least impact on sort of prices, which is really a, a, the S in ESG, um, is to invest simultaneously. Um, when you start investing in old energy assets, though, it gets tricky because um, you don't, you know, obviously you have to uh, help them improve, but at the same time, you know, you don't necessarily want to encourage um, you know, uh, massive amounts of new hydrocarbon development. So what we've done is we've uh, we've shut off any investments in, in in new production, oil and gas production, or coal, uh, and have focused solely on infrastructure. So um, you know, getting that production, that existing production, to market as efficiently as possible, as cheaply as possible, um, with the least carbon footprint possible. Uh, and the way we we make these investments really is the, through the, the structures that you mentioned, um, either sustainability linked loans for companies that have a um, uh, don't have a green use of proceeds, so to speak, and then green loans for those that are, you know, building something brand new that is uh, that is green and that meets one of the UN sustainability development goals. Um, but those that's that's how we're trying to achieve what we're, what we're out there to do. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, so we've, we've talked a little bit about the requirements and the, yeah, there's this, this sort of the transition, um, uh, you know, but plus the, the zero, you know, the zero goals plus the, you know, the current, uh, let's say investment requirements. Um, what about policy? I mean, I, I mean, Frank, I think you're um, in a very interesting point. If you look at Germany, uh, which is probably at the center of the, uh, the conflict here between, um, you know, sustaining the economy. I think you gave some interesting stats on uh, on on the demand side that's needed in Germany. Um, how are you seeing policy changing um, uh, to to kind of adapt to what's going on? Again, I, I think there, there, there are two two big drivers here. One is the reason driver, you know, and there. Um, and the, the German economy now needs to adapt quite quickly to, to be independent. Of and uh, um, before the, the war, uh, the Germany was serving 55% of the gas. And uh, now there's a big rush you know, to build LNG terminals, obviously. You can't build in, in LG terminals like like actually ordering a pizza and the two hours later the pizza is there. There is actually it takes five years, you know. And there are, so currently the, the the big infrastructure driver here is LNG terminals. There are, um, the direct infrastructure driver is the LNG terminals, which which is swimming around teacher and teacher terminals and trying to to um, be independent from um, the, the gas supply. And or, but the the downside of that is if you you actually are exchanging one evil with the other. On the other hand. You go into Qatar, yes, Germany, and uh, but the if you if you look at the again the big policy drivers is um, again um, the the what what's coming from the EU um, the. Um, it is the ESG regulation uh, which is driving actually the uh, all the you know, I think. Um, Everyone in the industry, even if, if you're not in the EU, you know, will be impacted by that. And that's TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosure, and the SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. Yeah, and there, um, TCFD basically you have to do for your whole portfolio a climate climate modeling exercise. Yeah, you have to go through all the climate perils, you know, with different time scales. Yeah, and uh, and so try to see whether you've got any risk there, and what do you have to do again uh, against this risk? This may have an impact that on your portfolio. You may actually um, identify strand, potential stranded assets. We have done that exercise uh, last year. It was quite a lengthy and also expensive exercise, and um, and uh, and, and touch wood, 
you know, um, our portfolio is is very resilient against climate risk. You know, and there are, that that was that was a good outcome. You know, and there, when we talk about climate risk, also fair to say it is eighty percent is flood risk. You know, be it be it river flooding or be it coastal flooding. You know, um, everything else in in the in their in, in the Western world is is probably less uh, less relevant on their own. You know? um, and SFDR, even though it's very technical, but the whole industry are also had to report um, emissions, you know, and there, um, scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, you know, where it's your own energy production, with your energy you're buying, and also scope three, you know, is basically what the su supply chain is actually uh, in the end, or, um, um, emission, uh, emission. And there, um, this is the big thing, you know, and there, Next year, as yeah, everyone has to report on that yeah, for the year 2022. And to gather the information is a huge exercise. We have currently set up in, internally a task group. Actually, we're not talking uh, setting up a framework to, go, to gather all the information. Yeah. It sounds it sounds very technical, but it's a big impact. If you don't report, you're not compliant. Yeah, and uh, uh, and uh, investors uh, look for um, SFDR compliant actually companies, and you will be hit eventually. By, but the investor money withdrawing your funds, you know, so that that's will be the impact. We're an Article Eight fund, you know, so we we concentrate on social infrastructure, yeah, you know, and people expect us to be compliant and reporting points. Yeah, that's a good point. So I mean, there's there's a, a policy driver for investment, but there's also a lot of compliance and uh, and risk on that side as well to make sure you're you're in the right place. Um, I mean, maybe I know you touched on inflation a little bit earlier. Um, but we just had, I think, today or yesterday, 8.1% in Europe, I think was the number. Um, yeah. Can you just detail, and you've done a, a deal, uh, I think you recently um, announced uh, an investment in a, a, a German German motorway. I mean, maybe you can just talk through how that, uh, how you see that asset um, in, in an inflationary environment, how, how it works, and, and also... I think people are changing their expectations on the speed of interest rates. Um, so what's the, the, the counter side of the inflationary part of that? Um, so how do you manage those two kind of uh, risks uh, in the yeah. portfolio? There, there's a couple of a couple of points here. And uh, maybe I'll start actually with, with inflation itself. And uh, um, yeah, infl inflation is certainly the, the number one topic or a key topic, I would say, for investors currently. Um, the most topical point here, uh, besides actually our ESG, I would say, and the Ukraine crisis, obviously, currently. Um, and our, our portfolio has a strong inflation linkage of around 0.5%. Uh, what does it mean? You know, so if inflation is one, it goes up by 1% higher than our assumptions, our return goes up by 50 basis points. It's not, it's not full protection, but I think it's an attractive protection of around half, half of the inflation. Yeah. Um, and that, that we have maintained for, for, for the last uh, 10 years since we IPO'd in 2011. You know, so we actively look for inflation linkage whenever we buy a project. Um, the A7, or maybe the second point on um, rising interest rates, um, leaving aside the impact on discount rate for a second, but rising interest rates do not have an effect on our portfolio at all in the sense of um, every project is financed until the end, until 20, 25 years. Uh, so there is no impact from us if there's rising interest rates. Yeah, we've got one project in Australia where we've got um, where the base rate is fixed, yeah, but the margin is not fixed here yeah, for the full term. Yeah, um, but that's the only project. Everything else, we've got full term financing. So we're not concerned about rising interest rates as from the risk point of view. That's an effect, a direct effect on our financing cost. Um, the A7, yeah, A7 was a great project, um, and um, we, are, we announced that in May. It's a German motorway PPP project. Uh, it's uh, north of Hamburg. You know, it's about 65 kilometers, and uh, it's fully operational. It, has, it was, was built between, I think, 2014 and 2019. Yeah? And uh, um, it has all the ingredients we like. Yeah? It's government. German Bund pays us for over 20 years residual term. Um, uh, an availability-based payment, so we're not actually de uh, depending on how many cars or lorries are on the street here. You know? So we get the payment, which is indexed linked from the German Bund. You know, there's an inflation linkage in line with our portfolio, you know, which was a strong feature. You know? So um, and uh, so it has got all the credentials long term, inflation linked, and highly credible actually counterparty that provides us with a strong strong visibility of cash flows over the next year, um, almost 20 years. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, I guess, an important point, um, the, the structure of your business. The, uh, I think in your annual report, you actually show the cash flows going out and you, you have a sort of a, a dividend progression set out there. So um, I, I guess you, you do have very high visibility, which is, uh, which is an interesting uh, place to yeah, be in, in, a, in, a, in a volatile kind of environment. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that's exactly what we offer is a very a defensive stock, you know, and, and, uh, yeah. defensive stock and uh, on the on the lower end of on the low end of the risk spectrum, if you look at equity, and yeah. we, have, we have just actually announced our dividend targets up to 2024. And um, we're very confident that we, we wouldn't do that if you're not confident to reach actually that one. And we always had a strong dividend cover here you know, of of a cash dividend cover of 1.3-ish for the last couple of years, you know, so um, there's still some buffer in there, you know, and there that potential to raise actually uh, the dividends further in the future, you know, and um, um, and, and uh, that that is is the visibility and predictable the cash flows is is the key attractive feature for of our stock here, sure, certainly in our business model. Absolutely, great. So uh, I mean, then, so we've kind of touched a bit on risk. Um, now, Laka, I mean, the, 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 the investment policy of, um, of uh, Aberdeen Diversified Income and Growth sort of changed um, sort of fairly recently. And uh, I mean, maybe you could, you could talk about how, how you think that's affecting the risk reward profile of, of the trust. And, uh, and, yeah, and again, how you, and how you achieve, uh, yeah, I, I guess the name is diversified. So maybe you can talk about sort of how diversified you are and uh, sort of what you're investing in. Yeah, sure. I think the, I mean, it, it's important, you know, at the time of the strategic review and, and where we were looking at optimizing a portfolio that, you know, the, the key you know, sort of principles around uh, protecting and growing the dividends, uh, creating a, a NAV profile that was, you know, sustainable and, and, and growing, um, you know, and in a multi-asset context using all the tools in the toolkit. So we, we invest across, you know, fixed income equities um, uh, at the time. And we actually introduced private markets to the portfolio in a fairly significant way. Uh, to provide some of these features that you know that Frank mentioned and, and Chris just talked about, so this this idea of dependability and reliability really came from the real assets part of the portfolio. So where we have, let's talk about the infrastructure specifically, but diversification came from a broad range of infrastructure. We think about it in like three to four baskets, I suppose, um, both from a developed market and emerging market standpoint. Then looking down sort of in the infrastructure sort of lens. Uh, you know, what's how much of that is economic, uh, if it's a transport utilities and demand led, how much of that is concession led, where these uh, cash flows are once again, inflation linked, linked back to, to governments with, with strong you know, sort of covenants against them. Uh, and then the energy part of the market. So whether that be distribution or generation and, and through that mix, you know, we have probably on an underlying basis, 20 or 25 large projects going on in the portfolio, ranging from um, <clears throat> investments into rolling stock, um, in the UK through to, to um, district heating in you know, Central Europe, uh, all the way to stadiums and hospitals in, in Mexico and Australia. So I think all, all of those provide um, diversification, both from a geographic standpoint, from a currency standpoint, from an execution risk standpoint, um, different drivers for all of those. Um, all of them are thematically sound, you know, long-term requirements for societies, either the, you know, the requirements for schools, hospitals, transport requirements, the energy needs. Uh, these are all long-term you know, thematic drivers up that aren't going away. You know, the energy consumption, as, as Frank mentioned, is, is going to be up significantly over the next decade. So, you know, we're facilitating that. Um, you know, we are very much focused on the decarbonization trail as well. You know, at the end of the day, we, we are balancing the needs of transition as well as trying to uh, promote a net zero program. So, you know, all of our new investments are, are looking at areas that can look to, to you know, participate in decarbonization. And whether that's replacing old rolling stock you know, diesel to, you know, to, you know, bimodal, you know, electric and diesel. Uh, and ultimately, um, you know, the energy side is, you know, renewable primarily if we're, we're focused on, um, you know, where we can get solar, you know, uh, in, we, you know, at, at a pricing point that is attractive. I think that's the other thing to, to think about. Some of these assets are actually incredibly expensive relative to historical pricing levels. So, uh, you know, trying to make sure that, you know, it's good value uh, versus the risk that you're taking on is, is, is a key consideration for us. So, so overall, I think the diversification comes from, you know, multiple investments across different sectors of markets that uh, the program itself, um, you know, is a, is a multi-year program. This is not about just putting money in today to try and get some of that diversification in over the next year or two. I think this is about, you know, a journey for five to seven years of, of minimum, um, um, let's call it, 
uh, a starting point as as I think as Frank mentioned, you know, these things don't turn up, you know, in two hours. You know, we, the planning, consent, uh, development management, uh, the execution risk, and then the ongoing maintenance and, and delivery of these assets are decades in the making. And and so what we want to do is make sure that they are uh, you know, entered into the marketplace with 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 strong foundations, you know, whether the contractual arrangements are are put in place, the op operational risk, I think, are, are not to be understated. You know, running a gas pipeline or a school or a hospital or, or a stadium is is not the same as buying equities. Uh, so, you know, we, we have to have a, a very strong oversight, governance and management process um, on top of these assets. Uh, and we rely on strong management teams to do that, both internally and externally. Yeah, yeah we, we saw operational uh, management of a stadium in a recent football match, as, as I recall. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, but I mean, maybe just quickly on, on interest rates as well. I mean, you know, the market kind of obsesses a bit about rates and things move up and down. I mean, do you worry much about interest rates in the overall portfolio? I mean, or or you know, just just how do you think about it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so rates manifest itself in a number of ways. So one one is sort of you know in terms of long long term discount rate movement. So if, if rate if if there's a risk off environment as a result of risk transfer between risk assets and non-risk assets, rates have a very key part to play with that. So if the Fed moved heavily and central bankers around the world move heavily on, on base rates, that will see a risk rating of assets uh, shift. Um, and I think, um, you know, we, we will see equity kind of come off on the back of that. Uh, once again, uh, you know, I think infrastructure plays a, a really strong role in defensive characteristics around, you know, rates movement. Um, it, it, the major driver for that is how it's come back to the inflation. So the reason the central bankers are doing this is to try and keep inflation at bay. So um, once again, as long as your cash flows are inflation linked or you have a strong inflation linkage within your portfolio, uh, you should have some offset, offsetting factors. Um, so, and then we have the additional challenge of actually multi, a multi-asset portfolio that has rates implications across, let's call it our liquid credit portfolios, our equities portfolios and our private markets portfolios. And to a certain extent, the mark to markets are less of a problem to us um, on the private side, uh, but it will have significant impact on, on the public side. So once again, we've shortened duration, we've gone to floating rates uh, where we can, we've hedged our, our rates position um, in, in a number of marketplaces uh, to be able to combat that, uh, to provide that overall, uh, you know, sort of upward pointing uh, kind of chart around where we think, you know, income is gonna come from. Uh, and actually if we're the beneficiary of, um, you know, rising rates that'll that'll translate to higher dividends that'll come back to us both from the credit and the equity side, uh, and then from the infrastructure portfolio specifically, it's making sure that that, that inflation linkage is actually translated to the portfolio and not just caught up in a in a pricing discussion. So um, that's where we you know we we take quite a close look at each of the individual programs that we're running to see what the inflation linkage and what the discount rate and rates management looks like. The financing and the refinancing risk, I know, uh, you know, Frank is in, in a luxurious position of being. Um, you know, covered for the term of this fund, but actually there's a number of projects that we're invested in that have rolling financing arrangements. And if you're caught, um, you know, having to refinance in a in a marketplace that um, is, uh, you know, less conducive of credit availability isn't there. Uh, and I think Chris will probably know that market quite well. You know, that that's where, you know, groups can step in and, and provide finance and, and liquidity at the right time and actually generate quite strong returns, um, you know, as we go through this refinancing cycle. Right, now that's very useful and uh, a nice, a nice lead into to Chris, just on the risk side, uh, um, uh, and, and and again, and like I was talking about the the income from these assets, and you guys are generating a very strong uh, income return. You know, how, how do you protect that? Um, and then, how, you know, how how do you think about interest rate risk and portfolio valuation and so forth? Sure. Uh, well, we make these loans that are floating rate. Right? Um, so they're all, uh, you know, I guess inflation hedges um, in and of themselves. But, you know, I think a bigger issue, um, so I guess short term, we're not that worried. We actually benefit from rising rates and um, we that onto our investors. I think the, the, the longer term impact of it is, is, is where the concern comes in. Um, one, um, you know, one of the reasons for inflation, of course, is, uh, the rising um, cost of energy. Um, ultimately, does that result in demand destruction? Um, some of the factors we talked about earlier around you know growing energy demand, 
um, and, and the demand for new projects and, and more access to energy, you know, that theoretically can be impacted the longer that the high price uh, environment um, lasts and we're, we're watching that closely. I think in the intermediate term, it's really around the refinancing markets. So we do rely heavily on, um, because we are short duration and, and sort of bridge finance uh, providers, we do rely heavily on a takeout, uh, typically again, one to two years after we make the loan um, and those markets have to be open. Um, historically, it's been mainly the M&A market that takes us out. But that market, of course, is a derivative of the bond and, and equity markets and the health of those markets. So uh, certainly the equity market, um, uh, you know, correction, if you will, um, the last three or four months is something that's got us uh, a bit concerned. You know, thankfully, energy companies have been um, one of the few, um, I, I wouldn't say bright spots, but neutral spots in the market in the last three months. Um, so that's, that's good. But obviously that, you know, if that uh, macro tailwind sort of lets up at some point, that could uh, reverse itself quite quickly. And then we'd be in a tougher spot getting refinanced out of these things. Um, short duration, we think, is a good uh, way to hedge yourself against both commodity price cycles and economic cycles. But it also has the dual-edged sword of potentially being in the wrong place at the wrong time, right? So what we try to do is manage the risk mostly uh, through that duration, but also being uh, first in the capital stack. So we're the we're the first lien loan, and if we get into a tough spot, we can't get refinanced. There is no market. Um, we're happy to work with the borrower typically um, and kick the can, as we say. Um, but that's going to require the borrower so so some some level of support. You know, will the, you know, is liquidity fine? Is, um, are they able to pay their bills? Um, because if we're, we're in a situation where our loan isn't covered and they're not willing to support it, that's where we have to take, you know, remedial steps and sometimes take, you know, step in and, and end up owning the assets. Definitely not what we go into these things trying to do, but ultimately that's our ultimate risk um, mitigant in the sense that if, if there's some, some issue where we have to hold it, then we can become more like, uh, my, my fellow panelists in owning these things longer term. And um, again, you know, that can have some benefits in the long run. So, uh, but that, that's how we look at the risk, Robert. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, so you are, you are floating rate and your first lien secured assets. Um, and I guess just on the, I guess on the duration, I think you have incentives for the, for the borrower to refinance in, in the structure of the loans as well, I think, right? Yeah, we're, we're quite, serious about our desire to be short duration. Um, we're not looking to be permanent capital to anybody, whether it's in debt form or equity form. Um, so all of our deals are structured to align our, uh, our returns with the company's business plan and when they should be able to refinance us with something uh, less expensive. Um, so all of our deals have uh, triggers in them that step up the cost of the capital over time. Um, and those are tied very distinctly to, you know, milestones in their business plan that they're supposed to be hitting. Um, so we've, we've had a lot of really interesting behavioral economics. Uh, we just had a deal taken out three days before a major step up in pricing. Um, so you can, you, you can really see it in action. And sometimes you, you lament, you say, well, geez, I wish they had missed us by four days um, and we got the extra bump. But in reality, it's there for a reason, right? We want people focused on getting rid of us as fast as possible. And then we sort of sculpt the returns to make it make sense for us. Mm. And I guess, um, you know, from a risk point of view, I think it's clear, you know, BBGI, Frank's, you know, business is, is being, is, is structurally very stable and, and um, you know, LAC has got a, a very wide diversification. If you look at, say, if, if your model, Chris, during you know the pandemic when oil prices completely collapsed, what, what, how, how was your risk experience during that period? Uh, painful. Uh, yeah. We had several companies um, come through maturity dates. We had several uh, owners say that they didn't have the desire or the wherewithal to support the companies. So we had to restructure probably uh, you know, five or six different companies during 2020, um, which felt very, very painful at the time. Um, today in the rear view mirror, uh, frankly, it's a, it's a, it's a, real, it's a real boon. Um, these businesses 
this is this is mostly businesses that were not infrastructure focused, more oil and gas focused, but they're they're obviously worth a lot more today than they were two years ago. So. Yeah, indeed, and um, and obviously the assets now are generating pretty high returns. So, I mean, that was probably about the most doomsday scenario you could get for the for the energy sector, I guess, uh, that you can imagine. <laughs> we, we try to, we, we didn't, we didn't have negative $37 oil in our model, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nor did we have 115 of them, so. Absolutely. You know, it just goes to show the volatility is is definitely persistent. So maybe, um, Nalak as well, I mean, you're, you know, you're an investor in the space and I guess, you know, you've, we've got a, a couple of companies, you know, alongside you today that were very different. Uh, you know, as an investor in, you know, many of these listed businesses, what what are you looking for in a, in a particular vehicle? Um, and what are you looking for in a, in a, in the management and a manager when you're choosing to invest in something? Yeah, I think um, it's multifaceted, I suppose, but, you know, we, we're very focused on the risk end of the spectrum, as you probably tell. <laughs> Um, and that manifests itself in, I guess, three major baskets. Um, you know, what, what's happening at the macro level and, and how does that affect the business? What's happening at the market level? Uh, and, you know, whether it be country or, or sector specific, and then what's happening at the idiosyncratic level? Like what's management doing on the ground in those markets to, to make sure that their business plans are, are, are going to be deliverable? And so, um, so when we, I guess, test um, them on, on each of those factors, um, you know, it's, it's really important for us to understand what their process is to do that you know how much you know depth and breadth is their platform enabled to deal with complex situations these are complex assets they're not simple investments as we've sort of described you know so you know the the, the management team's ability to um essentially deal with complex um you know structural situations that are going on in, the, in their assets so uh, you know we've been through a fairly turbulent time and you know how are they dealing with you know the the mechanics around contractual risk uh, the operational risk is not to be understated. You know, are they maintaining their ability to to you know, deliver you know supply or generation or or opex and capex profiles? Uh, pacing and deployment is an interesting one at the moment. I think it's, it's probably a sort of a valid question that we're asking a, a number of invest. You know, because we've deployed a significant amount of capital recently in so the U.S. Um, in the U.S. context, um, the. Uh, the the pricing levels and where they want to deploy capital in the near term versus where they'd like to um, deploy capital longer term and what their kind of capex profiles are going to look like, I think is one area that we're, we're particularly focused on. Um, and then how are they dealing with the more sort of regulatory end of the spectrum? So, you know, Frank mentioned the the, the tax EU, EU taxonomy, the you know the regulatory environment that's changing. You know, they've been trying to cope uh, with you know what is a fairly onerous uh, reporting framework uh, that we need to feed back to our investors and our regulatory um, you know environment too. So. Um, it's almost working in partnership now with our, um, you know, underlying investee companies and our GP partnerships to say, you know, how are we sourcing, you know, your GSG gas emission data? How are we trying to uh, deliver the KPIs that we've been set against the regulatory environment? Because um, not a lot of teams are, are actually resourced uh, to be able to provide that. And, you know, I think there's a, you know, a number of groups that, that are fortunate to have that support. But for a lot of managers that are very strong dealing at the operational side, they, they haven't got the resources to to deal with that. So, so, so overall, I'd say risk management is the number one area that we focus on and, and how they um, deliver that. Um, sorry, we interrogate their financing structures, their ability to execute and the track records to do that. But most of the time, you know, they've got strong track records that will deliver that. So it's really getting under the hood of their investment process, how reliable and repeatable it is. Um, and a lot of that comes down to key individuals in, in these businesses and their operating frameworks. Uh, the operational management teams are extremely important in these, um, and I probably spend more time making sure the operational capabilities are, uh, you know, up to standards. Um, and then for those that are growing teams or teams that are spun out from bigger shops going into, uh, you know, niche areas of the market, you know, how they're going to support that, those areas. There are very strong opportunity sets across the infrastructure spectrum, whether it be financing activity, you know, <clears throat> uh, actual development activity. Uh, all the way through to kind of standing stock. So depending on the risk profile that we're, we're looking at investing in, there's different questions to be asked, but it's really about that strength and depth of capability. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good insight. Pretty um, pretty comprehensive and thorough approach, I think. Um, we, we've got some Q&A. We've got some questions uh, online. Um, so I've got a... Maybe first, Chris, I mean, 
we, we, we touched on uh, on economic cycle risks. There's a question here. Um, you know, how do you manage the inherent economic cycle risk? Um, your sister trust blew up in the last energy bus. I think they're referring to the uh, the uh, the equity vehicle. Um, so, what gives me comfort? It won't happen to RCOI. So that's the you know. I think you partly answered that, but uh, maybe you could just differentiate what you do versus the uh, the equity vehicle. I guess what they do is also change to some degree as well. But. Sure. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, well, first and foremost, we're we're infrastructure only, um, so we we don't take any direct commodity price risk. Um, you know, the pipelines uh, uh, and other assets that we finance take indirect risk, which is really volumetric risk, but it's not it's not tied to revenue per se. Um, uh, so that's the first thing. So we're at least one step removed from, from direct commodity risk. Secondly, as I mentioned, we are first lien secured lenders only. Um, and, you know, in our first lien product, uh, which is, you know, our trust is just a small piece of what we do. I manage, you know, the, the, the two private funds that Riverstone Credit has and in addition to the trust, but we've, we've deployed about uh, $2.3 billion in first lien product in, in, in all areas of energy, including oil and gas. And we've done that since 2015 and we've done all that with zero loss ratio. Um, so the reason, the reason is, of course, is that your first lien, uh, your, your downside is owning the assets, as I mentioned, and certainly in some circumstances, owning the assets, even at a reduced entry level, like the, the, like the debt level versus the equity, you still could be underwater and you still have, might have a, a temporary mark below cost. Uh, but in the long run, we think that that is a very, very defensible position where you'll ultimately get at least your money back and, and a profit. Uh, and that's, I think, what our track record has shown. So, um, but uh, happy to talk about more of that, uh, more of that individually, if you're interested. And, and I guess there's, uh, I think, a point to mention before is you, you basically hold stuff at cost unless you've marked it down. So you, you, you don't sort of apply kind of discount rates to revalue stuff upwards. I think mean, that's that's correct, isn't it? Well, no. I mean, we use a third-party valuation service um, that values. Uh, you know, loans is loans, um, but but if it if it looks like it's equity, uh, whether it's been turned into equity or not, you know, in other words, if the enterprise value doesn't cover the debt, they'll value it as equity, um, even if it hasn't been restructured yet. And then they're just using fair market value uh, accounting to, to value every position. Yeah, but that's a pretty high discount rate, as, as I recall, right? I'm, I'm sure. uh, yeah, I mean, it, it can be. Yeah, if it's, I mean, some of these things. Um, it, it, when they're equity form, they could have you know twenty five percent plus discount rates to them. Yeah, it's what it's what the market yeah. pays, right? Absolutely. Great. Right. That's a. And we've got some more questions. Um, so for for Frank, do you report on the embedded leverage on the project level in your annual report? Um, the short answer is no, because we do we do basically. Uh, um, uh, just just actually report what the portfolio value is. Uh, they used to be for I think before 2014 or 15, they used to be consolidated accounts for every every portfolio company which we own 50 percent or more, uh, 50 more than 50 percent. You have to fully consolidate. The accounts were pretty meaningless because it's very difficult to interpret them the accounts. And 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 then the IFRS 10 was introduced, and that was really a good thing for investors because they're. It's much more transparent now, you know, and uh, how the reporting works, what the portfolio that it is. Um, on, on the investments, but on the investments itself, you know, um, it's it's um, pretty much sure, um, on the market how they are financed. There, you know, given that this uh, it's availability based payments with a very low risk profile, you get actually uh, that an amount of up to ninety percent, you know, and you got ten percent equity. And there are, for some people that may look scary, especially if you come from the real estate sector, you know, where they're more like 60% actually uh, gearing thereon, uh, not actually up to up to 90%. But if you look at that, actually, the default level of loans is extremely low. There's almost uh, almost not actually in the PPP sector which defaulted. Yeah, there may be a handful out of 800 projects in the UK where they had a default, and in, even in the default. Yeah, people got back got back got back their money here you know, on the debt side. Yeah, you know. so it is. Um, 
So therefore, uh, the high levels may look at the high levels of carrying may look a bit scary, but if you look at the detail and look at the risk profile, that has not changed. Even during the global financial crisis, here yeah, lenders were very comfortable to keep up the level of, of debt they are in. Yeah? and PPPs have been around. Public-private partnership projects have been around for the last 25 years. Yeah, and uh, since then, actually, you had always similar actually level of debt and and, and leverage there. On. I hope that answered the question. You're mute. Probably. It's probably not easy. So, um, in, in so there's a sort of a follow up to that by the same person. You say, how, how do you think about the leverage or, or manage it? I mean, is, is it, it, you know, it, it, do you think of a sort of a limit on that uh, overall for the portfolio? The, the limit is actually given, but the limit in the end is actually uh, what, what are the lenders willing to do and or what, what the project supports. And maybe coming back to the fundamentals of an availability based project. Yeah, and uh, why actually uh, you can actually support such a high leverage? You got contractual income from a government or government body. Yeah, and in our portfolio, typically it's triple A or double A rated actually counterparties uh, who actually uh, pay, pay us over 20, 25 years availability based payments. Then you got operational, you got a subcontractor who actually then um, manages our schools, hospital, road projects, prison projects, your uh, fire stations. Um, and that typically, the SFM contracts here you know, are typically going over the same length, you know, going over 25 years then. Then you got the financing, again, long term, you know, and, uh, and, and then actually you have to pay taxes. Taxes is something here you know, where um, you're subject to different tax rates. You know, so that's a little could be a little bit volatile, you know, but apart from that, the cash flows are pretty much fixed. You know, and there's very little um, room for, for, for change. That's, that's again, why you've got this highly visible Cash flows over 20 years coming out of our out of our business model, and that supports actually uh, the high leverage. And from that point of view, we are not concerned about that one because we, that has been around um, for about 20 years, 20 plus years. And uh, and lenders would have lenders actually would would a good indicator would be that if lenders on the on the in, on the way actually you know would say, "Hi, um, I misjudged that and uh, have to reduce the leverage," and I'm only giving you now let's say 60 percent. But that has not been the case, you know. So the, the, this ninety percent level is pretty much the standard, and so therefore, no worries for us or anyone in the market. Okay, that's clear. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we covered the, the stability of the cash flows pretty well. Um, there's yeah, a couple of questions for uh, Nalaka. Um, how do you manage the fixed income allocation um, and? How do you manage the asset allocation between the different fixed income sectors? Um, and there's a couple of follow-ups as well, which I can go to as well. Sure. So it's it's all part and parcel of the overall portfolio outcome and the construct required. So if we think about the optimization of the top level, how much uh, public versus private, you know, um, we put that into the mix uh, within the constraints around liquidity, um, around you know, sort of drivers of income. Uh, and then volatility, <clears throat> private having different characteristics around volatility. But <clears throat> essentially, that will give us sort of the mix between public and private. Then we look at the underlying economic drivers within the public sleeve and the private sleeve. Uh, and if we think about equities versus fixed income, then uh, we're really looking at a broad range of assets from investment grade, CD secured, uh, you know, bond market activity, all the way through to essentially emerging markets, um, credits, and sovereigns and corporates. Um, asset-backed securities, CLOs, you know, there's a broad range of credit markets that we can access. Um, and so when we then look at the credit sleeve, if you think about the credit sleeve specifically, uh, the portfolio also has an income um, outcome that we're trying to deliver here. So we're really looking at parts of the credit market that can deliver a high yield. So if we wanted the most safe, secure end of the market, that's cash and cash equivalents, which doesn't deliver much in terms of total return, perhaps negative at times in, in certain marketplaces. So, you know, we've got a target of delivering or defending a 5.6 pence per share dividend um, back to uh, investors. And so the credit elements of that have to deliver somewhere between three and 6%, um, you know, depending on, on the risk profile that we're taking. So we've um, specifically chosen to, to find asset-backed securities um, uh, as a kind of core generator of high yields, but has some security levels behind it. Um, we looked at the emerging market debt, both at the sovereign level and corporate. So investing in good companies with strong balance sheets that can pay their uh, a high yield back to us. And then we have a loans program as well, which we invest into a broad range of sectors. So 
Uh, the risk profiles of each of those, are, I guess, are calibrated within the portfolio to suggest how much risk we're taking at different points in the cycle. So that's, you know, three or four years ago, there was quite a large uh, portion of the portfolio invested in junior ABS um, assets. So where default rates were pretty low and economic growth was pretty strong and credit availability was strong, uh, we were happy to own higher allocations. As we move through the cycle, we'll reduce that pretty much in half. We've reduced our uh, <clears throat> you know, emerging markets allocations. We've reduced our uh, junior ABS positions. Um, I think as Chris mentioned, you know, they're operating in the senior space. We've actually moved up the rating scale. So we moved up to uh, from what was C to triple B to almost you know, um, investment grade in nature, but still generating high enough yields within the portfolio. Uh, liquidity is a big point. So whilst you can generate high yields, liquidity might be traded off to generate some of those higher yields. So we've invested in private credit on the private portfolio, which generates significantly at high yields, both in senior loans, junior loans, mezzanine. But from a liquidity standpoint, you can't crystallize them in a hurry. So, you know, we're trading off liquidity, we're trading off risk profile. And therefore, when we're optimizing the portfolio, we want to make sure that we're hitting um, some, uh, I guess, some parameters which allow some optionality. So if markets roll tomorrow, uh, <clears throat> what we want to be able to do is provide liquidity to markets at higher spread, so we generate some higher returns. Um, or switch into equity. You know, if there's equity sell-off, we can switch into the equity basket. Um, without spending too much time on it, the same principles apply for the equity side. So we're looking at, you know, developed versus emerging markets, trying to work out how we optimize our growth profile, if there's a rebound in markets, and how do we do that? Um, just uh, to close out the point around stability, we've actually uh, tilted our equities portfolio very much to the listed alternatives part of the market, looking at infrastructure, looking at healthcare royalties, looking at reliable income streams back to the marketplace. Um, and therefore, we can defend the dividends um, and provide some growth optionality as we go through the cycle. So, so it's a it, you know it's a fairly complex but thoughtful process. You know, we need to make sure that all of these component parts are working well together. And I think over the last you know two or three years, we've demonstrated that um, uh, you know that that this sort of resilience comes from you know good strong portfolio construction and risk management. And, and there was a follow-up. I, I mean, we can probably skip the, just how much is. I guess the real estate approach is similar. I mean, is there a lot to direct real estate approach? Yeah. So, if we, you know, we, we take similar exposure kind of to, to real estate um, in the context of private, our private markets exposure within the real assets basket. We've actually tilted our portfolio more to development of real estate. So, really, sort of change the dynamics around real estate um, to the longer term. You know, the use of offices versus residential versus logistics. I think the traditional asset classes have had a bit of a, um, a re-rating um, in, in many ways. So, you know, we're developing uh, logistics in, in China. We are uh, building uh, or repositioning um, uh, residential from office buildings in Europe. Uh, and we're accessing that to the debt markets as well, you know, be able to buy uh, credit <clears throat> or, or provide loan to, um, to real estate lenders, um, which will in turn, you know, invest that capital with, uh, you know, uh, developers as well. So. So once again, it's, it's all calibrated in the same way. We want to make sure that we're getting the best risk adjusted, you know, bang for buck. Uh, and, and I think that, that's where, you know, being able to, to have the flexibility to be able to tilt between asset classes or geographies or, you know, even uh, within the capital stack uh, allows us to navigate these sort of complex times. And, uh, and that's what ADA attempts to do, you know, sort of on a, on a fairly frequent basis is to, is to develop a strategy to, you know, to cater to, to the current market environment. And as a final question, um, both Frank and Malak, and maybe start with Frank, on, on the inflation linking, are there caps and collars around the, those projects in terms of inflation linking, or is it, is it something else? You are just on mute, by the way. Apologies. So, Frank, I think you're on mute. Yeah, so, yeah, so now it works, you know, technology. And actually technology issues. Um, apologies for that. Um, now, the short answer is no, uh, there are no caps and collars. What's happening is, is there's a built in contractual indexation mechanism in each of the contract. Yeah, so that means there, uh, for UK, for example, um, typically each uh, first, first of April around this year, then the inflation is adjusted for on a yearly basis. Uh, and then you get the inflation of the previous year. So, first of April 2022. We had the inflation of the year from uh, uh, end of March to first of the end of March 2021 to end of March 2022. And that basically is built in in almost all of our contracts. Um, and there's no caps and colors. There's one project where we have got um, a fixed in play inflation of 2% and for 75%. 
tender and, and then the, the remainder 25 percent is actually the normal cpi inflation but that's the exception you know so out of our 55 um essential social infrastructure projects here uh 53 54 have a normal indexation mechanism some of them actually have an index to um, have a more sophisticated index you know for example if you've got a road project sometimes you've got a little bit of cpi you know, then you got actually bitumen, you know, a bit of oil prices, cement prices, you know, got a mixture of that to reflect the underlying cost structure, you know. Uh, but eventually you got actually uh, the index there um, and you protect it from inflation. And also that flows through to investors with our inflation linkage. Right. Um, and Nalaka on your kind of infrastructure type projects, what, what's the structure? Yeah, there, there is, um, you know, as Frank mentioned, you know, our concession based or availability based infrastructure projects are pretty well protected from that standpoint. Um, uh, the demand side aspects, whilst they're sort of, you know, whether they're linked to energy prices or volumes, um, uh, there will be uh, in some cases caps and collars put in place to, to manage that from the risk of the operator being able to actually perform. Um, so if it goes beyond a certain point, you know, the affordability results in sort of levels of insolvency. <laughs> Uh, which can be uncomfortable at times, given the amount of leverage in, in the portfolios. So, um, so I think that, you know, for certain, you know, demand led projects, uh, we do have structures that, um, in both protect the investor and, uh, and the operator, um, on that basis. So, but I'd say for the most part, um, you know, it's, it's re given the level of, um, let's call it debt to equity ratio, um, within the portfolios, um, the, the inflation is, is able to absorb quite a bit, you know, so we can't sort of speculate as to what happens when things kind of approach the 15% or, you know, those sort of levels, because I think they will have, you know, sort of more sort of wider reaching implications, but, um, but, at, you know, sort of between, you know, five and 10%, it's, it's, you know, um, it's hedged uh, fairly closely. Yeah. Great. I'm just uh, conscious of time. Um, so maybe I'll just round up and we've, we've got three, three quite different businesses here, but I think, I think the common features is they're all actually supported by quite long-term drivers in terms of, uh, you know, especially the net zero transition. Um, and, and secondly, uh, they all have actually, I would say, they, they've expressed, you know, their risk management. And we've actually had probably the longest Q&A session. Um, so you see that some quite tough questions. I think investors are very focused on risk, uh, which is partly what this uh, seminar is about. And I think, uh, all the companies have covered off pretty well, and uh, and and some of the risks that we're facing at the moment, there is, there is some good protection um, either from inflation, or you know in Chris's case, you know you've got floating rates um, and first liens and so forth. So um, I, I think that's been very useful. Um, I'd like to thank all our speakers uh, for your time, and uh, I'll draw it to a close. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank Thanks, Richard.